Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this session, uh, which is sponsored by uh, Heart Research UK. The presenters will be expected to present their presentations, which have been prepared as video presentations, hopefully for five minutes only, which leaves us three minutes for questions. Uh, and please, we won't, we don't want to go over time with these presentations. I encourage the attendees to please put any questions in the chat box, which will uh, get around to and answer the questions after each presentation. So please put your questions in the chat as we go along and they will be answered. I'll hand over to my uh, co-chair, uh, Mr. Aschioni, Professor Aschioni, sorry, to start the first presentation. Hello, good morning, everybody. Raymond Aschioni from Bristol. And we have the first presenter, that's Marius Roman, who will present on phenotyping frailty through a multi-omics approach, a feasibility study in the OPCARD clinical trial. Please. Hello, my name is Marcia and I'm an ACL investor. I would like to present you today the study phenotyping frailty through multi-omics multi approach, a feasibility study in the OPCARD clinical trial. Multimorbidity and frailty often overlap and the current predictive scores are less accurate in elderly patients undergoing cardiac surgery, which echoes previous calls to include frailty as part of the current risk scoring. For example, in this meta-analysis by Akoin et al. Um, of 45 observation studies, they identified the specific frailty scales, maybe better predictors from some of, for some of the adverse outcomes. Um, similarly, Aguay et al., when they looked at 35 different frailty scores, showed that multidimensional frailty scores have the strongest association and largest predictive performance when it comes to mortality. All of these reflect the complexity of the frailty syndrome and the limited understanding of the underlying disease processes. For these reasons, I haven't characterized the patients just based on frail or non-frail, but based on the multimorbid or no uh, comorbidity status. I've screened 159 patients and recruited 30 patients that underwent metabolomics and mitochondrial function in plasma and myocardial biopsies, but as well, they underwent bridomics. In cardiac biopsies, I performed the enrichment and pathway analysis. Uh, this data shows that uh, the peak, a peak area ratios uh, identify important metabolites such as succinic acid, bifosphoglyceric acid, or c carnitine, which are linked with protein synthesis, mitochondrial transport chain, or the carnitine shuttle. While well, these graphs highlight different analyses of the targeted metabolites. The metabolites above the dotted line were considered uh, different between the groups using a VIP uh, score of more than one and a t-test less than 0 0.05. Well, these are the rock curves that um, identified the significantly different metabolites. The mitochondrial function was assessed in myocardial biopsies and plasma based on stimulation or inhibition of the mitochondria as described by Chuck et al. The results of the biopsies were inconsistent, hence why not presented here. When comparing mitochondrial function in plasma, the post-surgery non-mitochondrial oxygen consumption rate and oligomycin induced changes which were significantly different between the groups. These differences likely suggest that in patients with multiple comorbidities, um, the mitochondrial respiration is not restarted after surgery and in a great extent, rely on non-mitochondrial ATP production. In this pilot, we use both online and offline bridomics, which led to uh, peak tables of normalized um, samples based on background air samples. Following the data extraction, we identified 1,200 features um, of which, we of which we selected the highest ranking features based on separation between the two groups. 10 of the extracted features were of high enough um, uh, sensitivity and uh, degree of confidence and potentially highlighted two volatile organic components linked to oxidative stress, butanol and 2 methylpropanol When appraising our analysis, we used the LASSO model, which repeated this analysis 100 times. None of the identified features uh, achieved the 80 
hits threshold which we set. And this might be related to either the small sample size or um, the criteria of demarcation between the groups. In a future study, um, to increase the power of the predominance analysis, we would need to either have a, a larger, um, a larger population or a more distinct uh, separation between the groups as using, for example, a continuous uh, variable rather than a binary uh, variable. In conclusion, um, this pilot study demonstrates that met the metabolic status of patients undergoing cardiac surgery may be measured uh, consistently through mitochondrial function in, as well as metabolomics in plasma and um, myocardial biopsies. The limitations include the measurement of mitochondrial function in biopsies and the low differentiation of VOCs, which needs further work. This pilot will lead to future less invasive validation cohorts, um, which will assess the predictive, value, the predictive value of candidate metabolites in breath and blood um, as potential predictors of multimorbidity and frailty. Thank you. Yes, I think you're muted, Mohammed. Thank um, you, Marius. I, I have no questions in the chat so far, but please do submit your questions through the chat, but through the chat function. Uh, so perhaps I could ask a question to Marius. Can you hear me? Marius, uh, many congratulations for this work. Very nice and detailed. And I was so hoping that you could uh, um, uh, for example, highlight if this uh, was a, a disease-specific type of exercise, uh, for example, you know, simply, you know, related to more coronary disease or all the type of disease, please. So the cohort of, of patients were mainly cabbage patients that were selected, so we didn't have any valve patients. And the comorbidities, so so what, one of the challenges, actually, and, and this is one of my learning points from from this feasibility study is that wh whenever you you do approach it with a multiomics approach you should have a very distinct selection criteria because otherwise you just measure lots of features yeah. but you're not too sure which group they they belong to so for example when we looked more granularly at our comorbidities a lot of the patients were diabetic you know um but very few patients had renal disease so one of the things in which I, I move this forward um, is uh, to actually look at clinical phenotypes by analyzing HES data, whereby, for example, there will be phenotypes specific as a young patient with diabetes or an uh, older patient with frailty and chronic kidney disease. And that will allow us a, a, a much better, robust uh, sort of separation between groups. Yeah, I think that's interesting things. And my comment is indeed, it's an interesting exercise and also you need to validate the consistency of it towards frailty by doing more patient. But overall, well done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask my uh, co-chair, Dr. Chambers, to introduce the next speaker, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Adibayu. Um, He's going to talk about uh, BMI dependence of metabolic signaling pathways in myocardial biopsies on cardiac surgical patients. Thanks for joining. I'll be talking about um, changes in myocardial tissue with BMI from such a patient. Studies have reported that there is um, some survival benefit with increased BMI in surgery patients. Um, uh, some studies think this is due to a selection bias, but there is evidence to show that this might not be the case. However, in all of these um, cardiac tissues, the, the, the main culprit have not been uh, studied. So, uh, so the, 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 hypothesis, the hypothesis here is that um, with obesity, um, there are changes in gene expression within the myocardium itself, and that these changes uh, 
uh, eventually uh, induce some form of organ protection effect. So here in this study, we, we have around uh, six, six uh, individuals participating in the trial, and then uh, we, we are analyzing um, a large majority of them for transcriptomics and uh, metabolomics data. Uh, we, we're doing our, our weight groups uh, uh, in terms of obese, overweight, and normal weight um, with these um, categories. So uh, these are some of our data so far uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the figure here, each dot represents an individual. And what we're seeing is that for the transcriptome data uh, on the left of the figure, we, we see that there is a clear separation we, uh, from all three weight groups. And in particular, the normal weight groups uh, has the largest separation. Uh, it's quite projected away from the overweight group. We see a similar pattern uh, when we look at uh, the metabolite uh, data. So um, one of the things we've done so far was to look at what functions are the those differential transcripts are likely to impact, and that's the figure we have here. Um, uh, if for overweight to normal group, the, the bigger dots we see there are the differential transcripts, and what we see is that they they likely to have impact on transcription regulation, on uh, cell maintenance uh, activities like cytokinesis in you know, obese versus normal. They're likely to have uh, a, a impact on ATP synthesis within the mitochondria among others, uh, we also see some of these uh, similar changes in uh, obese uh, versus overweight. So to summarize uh, what we've actually seen from uh, the entire uh, function and analysis for uh, overweight to uh, uh, to normal group, which is uh, which is on the top uh, uh, part of the table here, uh, we see uh, changes uh, when it comes to transcription factors, system modification, fast storage. Uh, when it comes to the obese versus normal group, we see changes uh, regarding uh, energy production uh, within the mitochondria. We see this uh, transcript change, and uh, we see similar changes in obese to overweight groups. So, so overall, we we are seeing impact uh, in transcription, in translation, in even in, in neurotrophin uh, signaling uh, as in response to oxygen level as well as the mitochondria. So uh, when we also try to actually compare pathways to each other, we for the overweight to normal uh, group, uh, which is the top uh, figure here, uh, we see uh, upregulation uh, towards the right for uh, um, uh, electron transport chain, oxidative phosphorylation, uh, and for down regulation, we've seen a ribosomal translation. So we're based on normal group, uh, sort of uh, complements what we saw before in the previous slide regarding to translation, transcription, and uh, response to uh, oxygen levels. Uh, when we try to um, uh, integrate both of these types of data together, in, in the figure we have here, the, the, the transcripts, uh, 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 the, the genes are in the gray, the, the metabolites are in yellow. What we see clearly is that based on normal way, there is quite a, a large number of um, uh, metabolites that are differential. And we have four genes, a mitochondrial gene, a, a transcriptional factor gene, and a, a nucleotide uh, a modification gene being directly linked to uh, this uh, nucleotide. Uh, we, we see uh, changes also for overweight to normal with two genes that have been tightly linked Alpha 11 and CBA that one. And we, we also see some mitochondrial genes being differential, then being linked uh, directly to uh, uh, the ribose and ribose phosphates in the uh, obese versus overweight group. So, what do we actually derive from this study so far? One is that uh, uh, non coding transcripts are quite important in bio, uh, myocardial tissues when it comes to changes in BMI. There is a common signal in both transcriptome and metabolomic data when it comes to uh, the, the, the nucleotide phosphate, the energy store molecules like the AMPs and the, uh, and the, and the ATPs and, 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 the, and the likes. And we're seeing about four genes within the uh, atrial valve system that's linked to these um, uh, energy molecules. And, and in general, the transition to being overweight is 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 uh, a one is likely a switch in terms of the transcription regulators, and we are seeing impact on fast storage on uh, the electron transport chain. In, in, in the changes to the obese, we, we see a smaller level of switches to uh, in terms of transcription translation, but we also have an impact on response to oxygen level in neurotrophin signals and even the electron transport chain. Uh, we will see uh, two, three regulators like TAF11 and GAT1 that could be important in uh, these uh, switches the transcription system and the nervous system signaling could also be impacted uh, in, in, in these atrial tissues. Um, uh, thank you for joining.
Okay, thank you very much for that. Very interesting talk. Um, it's, uh, it's quite complex by the looks of things. Um, I don't know whether there are any other questions, but I had a quick question. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah good. Okay. Can carry on. Um, so uh, your, your samples were taken from um, atrial tissue. Yes. So how do you think this is the best uh, area to take samples? I understand that you, you probably can't take ventricular samples, but it would seem to me that ventricular samples would, might give you more, and more relevant information. Can you comment on that? Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, indeed, it was uh, perhaps more about um, how easier it was to um, get these tissues and what is probably more convenient for the, the surgeons, really. So, yeah, uh, potentially we could uh, get um, other kinds of information from uh, ventricle samples, but uh, it's a slightly more yeah, about um, what's probably more convenient and more uh, easy to see. So, but indeed, it's, it's something we, uh, we're we going to take a look at. Okay. Good. No questions in the chat, uh, David. Okay. Any other questions from the moderators? None for me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So we, we'll move on to, thank you very much for your presentation. We'll move Thank on to very the much. So moving to the next case. So, so um, shall we move to the next presentation? Yes, please. Can you, uh, Amina Khalil wants to present at 11.40. Is it possible to see if the next presenter is available after that? Okay, we can do that. In the meantime, Michelle, uh, is Jama, Jama with us? Uh, sorry for that. Um, I have two presentations, one at 11.24 and other at 11.40. If the one at 11.40 I can present first, that will be really uh, grateful. Uh, do you want to do it now? Yes, please. If I, I, I'm allowed, I can do 11.41 first and then 11.24 uh, one later on at 11.40. I like, I just want to swap these two. Sure. Professor Raschione. Okay, sorry, I just want to ask, before that, we have another presentation, Jama uh, Hadzad. Do we have a, a Jama Hadzad with us, please? Yama's not here yet. Okay, in that case, please, we, we move to um, Amina Halil, Khalil, who is presenting uh, her uh, 1140 presentation. And this is uh, kinetics, transcription factor, and protein expression of human right-sided engineered heart tissues, superside, this is the left side. Please, uh, let's have this uh, presentation on. Good morning, everyone. Many thanks for providing me with an opportunity uh, to present my project, which is based on kinetics, transcription factor, and protein expression of human cardiac fibroblast uh, from all four chambers in engineered heart tissues. This project was uh, funded by British Heart Foundation. In the past, we uh, have uh, seen that a fibroblast isolated from different chambers in murine models uh, depict a variable uh, weight and pattern of growth as well as the expression of the transcription factors. The 3D engineered heart tissues conventionally, they were made from cardiomyocytes and uh, they were usually human induced pluripotent stem cells derived cardiomyocytes. Recently, it was observed and that addition of the murine fibroblast or human fetal cardiac fibroblast to these engineered heart tissues not only improved their architectural support, but also enhanced the post output uh, calcium handling and even the expression of the mature sarcomeric proteins in them. In my project, we have investigated the mechanism of interaction between cardiomyocytes and the non-cardiomyocytes in terms of their coupling and paracrine effectors. These chamber-specific fibroblasts were co-cultured with iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes with a view that the rate uh, of contraction, force of contraction, secretory profile, and gene expression of the engineered heart tissues uh, will be different. 
we aim to find out that if one chamber uh, based fibroblast were better in terms of their kinetics and protein expression in comparison to the other chambers. The fibroblasts, they were uh, harvested uh, from the tissue samples taken from uh, all four uh, chamber myopsis in patients undergoing aortic valve replacement and uh, uh, coronary artery bypass crafting in, in 20 consecutive patients. It can be seen that the biopsy samples uh, from the atrium, they weigh much more as compared to the ventricular biopsy samples. The average left and right atrial biopsy uh, samples were between 0.6 to 0.68 grams, whereas the ventricular biopsy samples were 0.18 grams only as they were the true cut biopsies. The ESGs were, were constructing, uh, constructed as per SNATIS protocol, and uh, there was a standard and pre-tested ratio of cardiomyocytes and fibroblasts mixed, mixed together with a mixture of fibrin and thrombin. And this mixture was uh, then loaded on the silicon uh, scaffoldings. Not only uh, the cellular ratio, but the incubation setting, settings, bathing medium, changing of the bathing medium, and the temperature and recording of the kinetics was standardized as well. The medium uh, bathing the engineered heart tissues uh, was prepared in block and was changed every 48 hours. The kinetic recordings uh, were done uh, once the medium was changed uh, two to three hours prior to the recording. The temperature was optimized at 37 degrees uh, with pre-warming of the chamber and 33% uh, of the humidity was maintained with 5% CO2 flooded in the chamber. The video optic recordings uh, were continuously monitored for the accuracy as well. We can see in uh, this graph that uh, the right ventricular based uh, fibroblast uh, ESTs have shown better rate of contraction as compared to the LV and uh, biatrial uh, fibroblast based ESTs. Uh, it is depicted uh, by the p value. When the force of contraction was measured between all four chambers, again, it showed that the RV-based fibroblast has better force of contraction as compared to the LV and both atrial fibroblast-based ASTs. And when they were compared with the other groups, such as fibroblast-only DCM, fibroblast-based ASTs and cardiomyocyte-based ASTs, Although there was some compar comparative uh, force of contraction, but still RV-based fibro RV fibroblast-based ESTs depicted better force of contraction. This is better depicted in this graph. Uh, in this um, graph, as we can see, that the p-value is quite significant uh, when the comparison is made between RV-based fibroblasts to the RA and LV-based uh, fibroblasts. When the uh, resting length of ESTs was measured, both the atrium, left and right atrium, they showed a comparable resting length of ESTs. However, the RV uh, based uh, fibroblast based ESTs, com in comparison with the LV fibroblast based ESTs, showed a sh shorter uh, resting length and therefore the force of contraction was better. The T120, which is the time taken. Uh, from the initiation of the contraction to the peak contraction is comparable between all four chambers, but uh, RV fibroblast-based ESTs have sh shown shorter T120 and T220, which is the time from the peak contraction to full relaxation, was also shorter in uh, RV fibroblast-based ESTs in comparison with the others. Further on, the proteomic expression of these uh, chamber-specific fibroblast-based ESGs was compared on uh, different days. Uh, day 2, 8, and 16 were selected, and a certain amount of proteins, uh, they were selected out of 102 proteins based on the fact that they were secreted more prominently from uh, within chambers. And we, we can see uh, in comparison of the left atrium and the right atrium that uh, the protein expression is almost comparable on all days between the two chambers. However, when the right ventricular and the left ventricular uh, uh, chamber uh, specific fibroblast uh, based protein uh, secretion was compared, then right ventricle secrete far less uh, proteins into the bathing medium as compared to the LV. 
And this can be the uh, reason that why our right ventricular fibroblast-based ESTs depicted better kinetics because these uh, proteins, they can be inhibitory. So as a conclusion, we can say that, uh, that ESTs uh, with all four chambers exhibit some chamber-specific variation in terms of their kinetics. Uh, this guy is depicted by a difference in the chronotropy, inotropy, resting length, and fractional shortening T120 and T220. On comparison of the left-sided and the right-sided uh, chambers, the kinetic changes were more prominent uh, on uh, the right side as compared to the left and uh, in comparison with the upper and lower chambers. Comparison of the both atria among themselves and both ventricle among themselves uh, did not show those uh, characteristic changes. The age, size, and passage or uh, stage of the fibroblast used in ESTs have a significant impact on their kinetic behavior. And the fibroblast, uh, which are harvested from the same environment, that is from all four chambers uh, within the same heart, showed um, pattern of kinetics, uh, which can be related to each other. And uh, the kinetic parameters, they are known to affect each other, like the chronotropy uh, affects the inotropy. And it can be seen that um, right ventricular fibroblast based ESTs, they have uh, increased rate of contraction and that gets translated into a better uh, course of contraction as well. In conclusion, we can say that the right ventricular fibroblast uh, exhibited, uh, right ventricular fibroblast based ESTs exhibited better kinetics than other fibroblasts based ESTs. Thank you. A very interesting presentation. Um, I hope you are still with us. Yes, you are there. Nice. Uh, and. Um, so also it was a little bit long, but it looks like one or the other presenter is not with us. And therefore, perhaps there is a time for a quick question. Um, is there anything in the chat, uh, Mahmoud? No? So in that case, uh, it's no clearly, you know, you did a lot of work. And uh, could you please clarify for us? Uh, yes, Mahmoud? So, sorry about that. Just one question. What was the demographics from which the cardiomyocytes were derived? You muted, uh, Amina. Sorry. Uh, they are human uh, iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes, and they were uh, from the pulmonary region, and they were at day 18 of uh, their regeneration. And they were the same. The population of cardiomyocytes was same for all the groups. Okay, um, so I think uh, perhaps uh, with that we might uh, complete this presentation. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, since you have a, a, another presentation with, with us, uh, we have made the plan for uh, your next presentation, the one you are eleven twenty four, to be given next if you are happy. Yes, please. Okay, in that case, uh, please uh, uh, let's move to the next presentation, still by Amina Cahill, which is about the minimal proteomics expression of right ventricular fibroblast. Uh, based the uh, uh, tissue engineered tissue uh, defined the rationale of better kinetics than other chambers, please. May I remind faculty to, to mute, please. And, and it, this, was, this was periodically uh, checked at day two, day eight, and day 16. An RD proteomic profile uh, cytokine antibody uh, kit was used and uh, this contains nitrocellulose membrane which has 102 protein in uh, imprinted on it in duplicates it can detect multiple cytokines chemokines growth factors and other soluble proteins these membranes uh, they were soaked in est medium and later on they were exposed uh, to detection antibody cocktails tryptophan and cameo reagents once all these uh, reagents uh, were used, the membranes were examined under X-ray for one to 10 minutes and multiple exposure times were used. The expression of protein was quantified as mean pixel densities. 
a scheme of uh, representation of uh, protein uh, was uh, generated, uh, which ranged uh, from uh, absence of uh, any expression uh, to a maximum or strong expression, uh, ranging from uh, 20,000 uh, mean pixel density uh, to a mean pixel density or ranging more than 400,000. Later on, uh, this mean pixel density um, uh, was coordinated with heat maps, which uh, in which uh, we have we are showing uh, that purple color exhibits the maximum mean pixel densities, and uh, pink color depicts uh, the faint mean pixel densities. Since we were trying to quantify the expression of the protein, it becomes of, uh, of paramount importance uh, that we find the proteins which were already present in the fresh AST medium uh, as well. So uh, the Freshly prepared EST medium was checked for the expression of proteins, and it is quite clear that um, in this nascent medium, uh, there are many angiogenic uh, factors, interlinkings, uh, some inhibitory proteins, uh, tumor necrosis factor, uh, and um, vascular uh, endothelial factors as well. The expression of uh, the uh, protein secreted uh, uh, by the uh, fibro different fibroblast based ESTs showed uh, that ESTs uh, with left and right atrial fibroblast um, secreted uh, uh, similar, uh, um, similar and comparable uh, number of uh, proteins on all three days. However, the comparison of the right ventricle and the left ventricle showed that far less amount of proteins were secreted by the right ventricle as compared to the left ventricle. This heat map illustrates uh, better the expression of the proteins and it further clarifies that even among uh, the uh, comparison of the uh, right and left atrium, the protein expression uh, in right atrial uh, fibroblast-based ASTs um, on day 16 subsided quite significantly as compared to the left atrial fibroblast-based ASTs. And uh, further on, uh, the right ventricular fibroblast, um, when compared with the left ventricular fibroblast-based ASTs, showed far less less number of protein expressed um, and uh, the maximum uh, amount of protein expression was detected on day eight. When we uh, calculated the cardiomyocyte only EST's uh, expression of protein and fibroblast only EST uh, uh, based uh, protein secretion, we found out uh, that actually the expression of the proteins was more pronounced in uh, cardiomyocyte on the ESTs as compared to the uh, fibroblast-based ESTs, which showed quite a faint expression of uh, all the proteins. So in conclusion, we can uh, declare that cardiomyocyte-only ESTs showed uh, most of the proteins secreted in the ba uh, bathing medium. And uh, it further uh, shows uh, that cardiomyocytes are the only cellular population responsible and, uh, of secreting and replenishing the protein in the entire lifespans of EST uh, and the uh, constructs. When a comparison is made of the protein profile of cardiomyocyte only ESTs and freshly prepared EST medium, it, uh, it became quite evident uh, that the expression of uh, the proteins uh, with, uh, in uh, cardiomyocyte only ESTs was quite different from freshly prepared ESTs. And when we prepare, uh, compared the fibroblast only ESTs uh, with the uh, EST medium, then only a few proteins were secreted by the fibroblast, and the expression uh, was, uh, although very weak to begin with, and faded away quickly over the course of time. The right atrial and left atrial uh, fibroblast based ESTs showed a similar expression of protein. The protein expression of uh, RB-based fibroblast uh, was uh, quite meager and uh, scanty. And there is a strong possibility based on these observations that proteins which are secreted by the fibroblast and cardiomyocytes were uh, strongly inhibited in RB fibroblast-based ESTs. And right ventricular fibroblast-based ESTs exhibited the best kinetics, and this can be secondary to inhibition of the inhibitory proteins. However, this data which we have uh, presented over here is a semi-quantitative data and it has to be further uh, validated at more uh, regular interval with more number of uh, patients. Thank you very much.
Thank you. I mean, the question from the chat uh, from Marius, excellent presentation, Amina. Why do you think atrial protein expression is higher than ventricular protein expression? Uh, there can be multiple reasons for that. First of all, the atrial samples, they were five times in size and the number of uh, atrial fibroblasts, uh, because we have to quantify the number of fibroblasts that we are adding. But if you have a look how when we um, isolated uh, these uh, atrial fibroblasts, uh, they were larger in size as compared to the ventricular fibroblasts. The ventricular fibroblasts were taken from the true cut biopsies. So their average weight was 0.1. This can be one of the contributing factor of that. Secondly, atrial fibroblast, they are of neural crest origin. And the ventricular fibroblast, they are derived from two sources, truncogonal cushion of the heart and uh, the developing endocardium. So it might be possible that actually uh, there is a different origin which is attributing to their uh, different characteristics. And secondly, I think uh, later on in life, when they are exposed to different type of stress, different pressures, that changes their characteristics as well. David, thank can you. Ask, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, so it's very interesting uh, two talks. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so you've got this engineered heart tissue. Yes, please. What What do you propose to do with it? Is it used to? <laughs> very good question, Prof. Prof, uh, we started uh, with the view. Uh, we have entered into the second phase in our lab. So first of all, we were generated in the in in engineered heart tissue, which ex actually exhibit the kinetic properties outside the heart. Now we have uh, started making engineered heart tissues, which are about two into two inch in size. And then further on, we induced the infarcts in rabbit population by uh, clamping their LED and put these in uh, these patches on over there with the help of a glue and to uh, this the it is an amazing thing that actually over the course of next three months the myocardium regenerated the ejection fraction which dropped down to 25 percent went back to 60 percent in this rabbit population so we are proposing that in future we can have these patches and you can put them to the uh, any infected territory and they can release some paracrine um, proteins uh, which can induce the myocardial regeneration and uh, but one thing is that still we have to um, uh, introduce some angiogenesis in these patches which we haven't done because we haven't introduced the endothelial cells in these patches so far okay okay well that sounds very interesting i'd be interested to hear next year's uh, abstract in the meeting to uh, report the results of that study thank you very much thank you thank you uh, so uh, one thing i forgot to mention earlier is that on slido uh, attendees can read the uh, presentations. Please, if you have uh, the ability to open Slido and read the presentations as we go along. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to read the, the previous presentations as well. Okay, we'll move on to the next one. Thank you, Amina. So, so there is a new sequence that we have been provided uh, and perhaps uh, uh, I just, uh, uh, so it looks like 11.32 goes to now, Savannah. So, David, do you want to take that and the next one? So uh, 11.32 and next 11.48 presentations to be to be next. Okay, so um, Savannah is- I mean, I can come off the stage now, please. Thank you. Amina. Click the, green, the red button and you can come off the stage. Amina, please, thank you. Okay, are we ready to go? We, do we have Savannah? We don't. Savannah there? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, there she is. Okay. So um, <coughs> our next presentation is by Savannah Gisling. I hope that's pronounced right. Uh, a systemic review of the quality of abstracts reporting on randomized controlled trials presented at major international cardiothoracic conferences. Hello and welcome to my presentation. My name is Savannah Geising and today I'll be presenting a systematic review of the quality of abstracts reporting on randomised controlled trials presented at major international conferences in cardiothoracic surgery. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. To give you some context, not all clinical trials have their results published, with publication rates varying between 69.6 and 71.3% in dedicated tracker systems. 
At the same time, there's been a movement towards including unpublished research in research synthesis. Furthermore, conference proceedings may be the only accessible report of a given trial. This is evidenced by a recent meta-analysis, which showed that 48% of RCTs presented at conferences had no subsequent full-text publication. In addition, poor reporting in conference abstracts may impede their interpretation and application to clinical practice. To address this specific issue, the Consult Group released a statement in 2008 and guidance on reporting randomised trials in conference abstracts. This included a 17-item checklist, which is displayed here. Our research question was, what is the quality of abstracts reporting on randomised controlled trials at contemporary major international meetings in cardiothoracic surgery? We performed a systematic review of all available abstracts presented at annual meetings of major cardiothoracic societies between 2016 and 2018. We included all conference abstracts reporting on RCTs, and these were screened by two independent raters. Data was extracted into a custom database and all abstracts scored against the 17 item consult checklist by two independent raters, with a mean raw percentage agreement between the two of 79%. Any discrepancies was, were resolved by a senior author. Our primary outcome was the degree of adherence to the consult checklist in individual articles. We also looked at the checklist adherence across conferences and years, and also looked at the reporting across each of the 17 checklist domains. We also investigated the, the predictors of overall checklist score and the association between checklist score and full text publication. Our analysis was performed in Starter with analysis plan displayed here. Of the seven major cardiothoracic societies, five made their conference proceedings available online or on request. Two unfortunately did not. A total of over 3,000 abstracts were retrieved and reviewed. Of these, 100 reported on RCTs, with about 50% identified in clinical trial registries and about 50% still remaining unpublished. In a general overview of the trials, the majority of them originated from general thoracic specialty and looked at perioperative interventions. About 50% of them were derived from European centres. In our primary analysis, a mean score of 6 was achieved out of 17 checklist scores. Looking at checklist adherence by conference, we can see that there is no difference between conferences. However, this may also be related to a significant difference in proportion of RCTs between conferences. There was no association between checklist adherence and year. Looking at the individual checklist domains, the most highly rated and well-reported components are highlighted in green with the worst highlighted in yellow. The most well-reported components include intervention, objectives and conclusion, with the worst including contact details, randomization and funding. You will also see that outcomes were poorly ranked. And this is to do with the fact that oftentimes the effect size was not reported. Looking at predictors of checklist score, our multivariate analysis show that only trial registration, word count and direct reference to the consult checklist were associated with a higher checklist score. There is no association between checklist score and eventual publication. In conclusion, half of the randomised control trials presented still remain unpublished and the reporting quality of the RCTs at conferences remains poor. Our recommendation is therefore that consult should be adopted by organisers and authors to drive meaningful reporting of RCTs at major conferences. Thank you. Thank you, Savannah, for your presentation. Uh, may I start with a question for myself? Uh, if somebody has gone through the trouble of uh, conducting an RCT and presenting it, why are they not publishing it? That's quite a good question. So I think a lot of the time it's got to do with the actual trial design and whether there was failure to recruit the enough participants to eventually get it published or that the trial design was so faulty from the first start that they weren't able to actually complete the trial. And that has led to a lot of trials not being published fully. However, a lot of the times the results are either presented as interim results or as a pilot study or as a feasibility study. They're already presented at conferences and those results will be available online. 
which is why it's important that those results are then accurately reported. Thank you. Another question. Uh, given the tight demands for word counts on abstracts, do you think, is it possible to include all the information? Did you look at the various abstract submission requirements to see if some of the conferences allowed all the information to be seen? So we did show that um, having a word count of over 300 was associated with better reporting. However, the actual consort checklist items themselves and the consort group have stated that they expect that all of the items should be achievable within a word count of 250 to 300. So I think there is some argument towards whether or not the wording list should be extended or not. But the expectation is that you should be able to include all the 17 checklist items in th below 300 words. Thank you. Any questions from the panelists? So if, perhaps I could ask a question. I was interested to see that EACS had refused your request to look at their data. Um, I mean, that's a big one for, for cardiothoracic surgery. Why do you think they, they refused that? So the EACS data, the initial, um, the 2016 year was available initially. So we had started analysing that and in between our an analysis and the second reviewer looking at the um, conflict abstracts, they all taken down. And we're not sure if that's because the website was being restructured when we wrote and requested for um, them to be made available, we weren't really given any further information, so I'm not quite sure what happened there. A very quick one, a final quick one from me, Mahmoud. Uh, so, so, uh, so, well done. This is a very interesting subject, uh, and therefore the rigorous approach to how we publish and report the data is so important. So did you find, or uh, did you manage to look at also who was sponsoring the roughly 50% of RCT not published the report because there seems to be uh, an important link between data not reported and the sponsor. So we weren't able to unfortunately find that, but we did find that funding was one of the worst reported items. I think it was less than five RCTs who actually reported their funding. And I think that's just due to a lack of explicit expectation and strict endorsement of the consult guidelines towards authors in abstracts. Because we know in actual full text publications, it would be very difficult to get away with not publishing your funding. However, there's not really that expectation or that strict endorsement for conference abstracts, which we th think there should be, particularly when you see that only 50% of these will actually end up with a full text publication. We need to know where the funding is coming from. Thank you very much. That's Thank you, Savannah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so we'll move on to the next presenter, please. So um, I'll take that one. So the next presenter, according to the list provided, is uh, uh, Rick Carson. Is Rick Carson with us? If, if Rick is around, can you come to the stage, please? Yes, Rick is there. Please come to the stage. Uh, and uh, the presentation is a publication impact and force in cardiac surgery of metrics versus bibliometric analysis, a new tool to guide future research and training. Could we please uh, uh, start the presentation? I can see that Rick is there. And, um, and good morning. Uh, so this is a presentation on my work um, entitled Publication Impact and Force in Cardiac Surgery, Altmetric versus Bibliometric Analysis, uh, a new tool to guide future research and training. So very briefly, what are bibliometrics and altmetrics? Well, bibli bibliometrics um, is a statistical method that utilizes citations of um, publications um, to estimate the impact um, publications and research have within a specified field. Um, altmetrics is a more qualitative measure um, that uses citation analysis on the side, um, but also includes data from uh, discussion on blogs, social media and policy documents and mainstream media coverage um, to also assess impact. So bibliometric analysis has been suggested as a potential tool to guide research in a specified field. It's thought that the most cited um, pay articles are the most landmark titles that have the highest impact within their speciality. Um, citations however take time to accumulate and the advent of newer um, platforms disseminate information more rapidly, um, a newer method of analysis may be needed and this is where altmetrics comes in. So our aim was to investigate whether higher citations correlated with higher impact and secondly whether altmetric data would reflect citation data on um, the impact a paper has in research and surgical training. 
The methods employed involve searching the Thomas Reuters Web of Science database with the search terms cardiac and surge. Um, texts were limited to full uh, text, English language only, um, and then ranked by a um, citation. Um, the top 100 were then analyzed for topic, journal, author, year, institution, and altmetric score. Um, a total of 3,685 eligible articles were found between the years 1998 and 2015, um, with a median citation number of 36. The most cited article had 574 citations and also the highest altmetric score of 130. Um, the most adopted um, altmetric platforms were patents, Twitter, blog posts and Wikipedia. So um, this graph basically just shows the cumulative number of citations per year for the top 100 papers. And it's interesting to note that there's a nice peak between 2009 and 2013. Um, and we would think that the use of social media and other alternative platforms um, has risen in this time period. Um, it's very difficult to go through all 100 articles, but this uh, table just goes through the top 10, um, just based on journal and sort of citation or metric score. It's imp interesting to know that obviously the higher the citation number on the whole, um, these top 10 represent the highest impact factor journals. And um, it was found through the overall analysis that the annals of thoracic surgery had the most papers within the top 100. Um, uh, it was also interesting to note that the altmetric score um, was Quite, quite had quite a broad range, certainly within the top 10 as well. In terms of what metric sources of information, um, basically patents um, accounted for the highest percentage of 48%, so whilst 24% um, were distributed via Twitter. Um, blogs accounted for 14% and policy source 10%. Um, other th other uh, sources such as Facebook um, and Wikipedia's were also represented um, here within the altmetric analysis. Now, interestingly enough, um, there is a small tangible um, link between altmetric score and average citations per year, um, this represented in this graph here. A p-value of uh, 0.042 was actually deduced from uh, the regression analysis of this um, and would suggest an evolving relationship between altmetric score and average citations per year. Now, in terms of our discussion, so this is the first study of its kind to compare the roles of bibliometric and altmetric analysis. Um, altmetric is a new tool which will account for these newer platforms um, um, and the role of alternative platforms um, basically for distribution of research and publications within cardiac surgery has grown. Um, we've established that there's potentially a newly developing link between citations and altmetric score, which would hope would strengthen over time and further use of altmetric platforms. Um, now, a potential factor in training uh, using tools such as journal clubs um, with trainees, um, we can actually use citation scores to highlight the key papers for discussion um, within our speciality and then distribute by altmetric platforms. Um, alternatively, um, when guiding research, um, you can also use it to, um, guide, to find the highest impact factor um, papers and research within our speciality to guide research. Um, now, the use of altmetrics, it's also easier to potentially identify newer um, research and development um, and also unpublished data, as well as gaps in wider knowledge within our speciality. Hopefully, we can use these tools to then guide both um, the tr both the trainees' own research and training, um, which would allow trainees to keep on the precipice of new data, guidelines and direct research in the future. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Rick, for your presentation. Um, may I start with a question? So you are saying that we should be guiding research in, in pop by populist demand rather than by uh, what we think is the next thing that we should be looking at. research and development and also on published data as well as gaps in wide knowledge Can we stop the presentation, Clint? Thank you. Right. Can you, did you hear my question? You, uh, Rick? Can you hear me? Rick, can you hear me? If you hear me, can you hear me, Rick? We, we can hear Rick? you, Mahmoud. It looks like Rick can't. Rick is frozen. Are you are you able to ask, to hear my question, Rick? Rick, can you hear me? Um, yes, yes, we can hear. Yeah. Okay. It, my question was. Uh, so you think we should be guiding research uh, according to populist demand rather than what we think is the next thing that we should be looking at? 
Can you hear my question? No, sorry, it keeps cutting out. <laughs> okay, I'll ask it one last time, and then if if we if you're not able to hear me, we'll have to move on. Uh, so uh, the question was: Do you think we should be guiding research by, by populist demand rather than by what we think is the next thing that we need, should be looking at? No, not not necessarily. This the, the idea of this was as um, especially for guiding sort of more junior trainees um sort of in um the role for both in certain i i am i, I am sorry we can't hear you the link is, is your link is very poor yeah. so if you if you would mind putting your answer in the chat and we will move on to the next speaker please thank you very much uh uh, Mahmoud and uh, David, uh, we have some um, uh, information through which uh, two presenters are not with us. So um, these are uh, these are uh, from he so 1156, and indeed uh, Jama. Uh, and we've been asked uh, if we should still have the video uh, and have the presentation, but of course there will be no questions. I guess that will be a good way forward, and therefore the next presentation is the 11.55, please, even if we don't have the presenter. The presentation is uh, pulsatile flow used during cardiopulmonary bypass as a positive impact on inflammatory markers and hemodynamics. Okay, if, Rick, if you wouldn't mind exiting the stage, please, by pressing the red button. And, uh, Hello, my name is Lisa Baskin, and, and today I'm going to give a presentation on the pulsatile flow used during cardiopulmonary bypass as a positive impact on inflammatory markers and hemodynamics. A systemic inflammatory response, largely determined by the blood exposure with foreign surface and the activation of the complement in the cardiopulmonary bypass (CPB). The pulsatile CPB is associated with a reduced inflammatory response, higher rate of oxygen consumption, and a reduction in the level of metabolic acidosis compared with non pulsatile patients. Architecture characterizes the pulse is determined by the mechanism of blood flow generation and its interaction with the environment in which it operates. We have selected 100 patients from pulsatile and non pulsatile type of coronary artery bypass graft patients and measured colloid osmotic pressures at 10,000 and 100,000 Dalton pore sizes. Osmolality and histamine levels at 10 time points, starting from pre-operative to post-operative periods. Venous blood samples were taken at the following time points. Having measured colloid osmotic pressure in groups of CPB patients undergoing coronary artery bypass surgery, both pulsatile and non pulsatile, we found that both groups of patients exhibited a similar colloid osmotic pressure profile, with a fall in colloid osmotic pressure on the initiation of bypass, followed by a gradual rise in colloid osmotic pressure up to the 96 hour post operatively. There was a slight variation in the plasma osmolality, but overall, this parameter appeared to remain relatively stable throughout the period in both groups. The venous plasma colloid osmotic pressures and osmolality in pulsatile patients is seen through these graphs. As you can see in both pore sizes, they are relatively the same with only a few differences, while the osmolality is roughly the same. Now you can see the non pulsatile patients. Both the pore size are the same, roughly, while the osmolality remains steadily along the same. In the pulsatile group, plasma histamine was barely altered throughout the clinical course. In the non-pulsatile group of patients, plasma histamine was found to increase by an excess of 1200% during the perfusion phase, as you can see in this graph. In conclusion, all patients in the present study exhibited a similar colloid osmotic pressure and osmolality profiles throughout their clinical course. The difference between pulsatile and non-pulsatile groups of patients in terms of plasma histamine 
was highly statistically significant and clearly demonstrates that flavorodality has an effect on histamine activity. If you have any questions, please contact me at india at .com. These are the references and thank you for listening. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, so the, the next presentation is again, uh, we have a presentation, but not a presenter. Uh, so the presenter should have been uh, Yama Azad. So the presentation uh, could start. The title is Vitamin D Induced Cardio Protection by Modulating Mitochondrial Respiration After Simulated Ischemia and Reperfusion in Cardiomyocytes. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to present at the SCTS annual meeting in 2021. My name is Yamo Hafsat. I'm one of the registrars working at Castle Hill Hospital. I'm going to present vitamin D induced cardio protection by modulating mitochondrial respiration after simulated ischemia and the perfusion uh, in cardiomyocytes. Mitochondria plays a critical role in cardiac function and cardio protection pathways. It uses oxygen for respiration and therefore respiration is inhibited during ischemia and re-established during the perfusion. Uh, during ischemia, this results in reactive oxygen species generation and mitochondrial calcium overload, which um, leads to myocardial cell death. So our aim was to establish if therapeutic doses of uh, vitamin D impact mitochondrial respiration during the perfusion after exposing cardiomyocytes to simulated ischemia. In order to do this, we used I-cell cardiomyocytes, which are spontaneously electrically active in atria and ventricular um, light. Uh, myocytes, which has typical uh, biochemical, electrophysiological, and uh, mechanical characteristics as cardiomyocytes. They were grown for seven days in standard cultural conditions. Uh, the cells were then uh, dosed with either 50 nanomole of vitamin D, which corresponds to insufficiency, or 100 nanomole of vitamin D, which uh, corresponds to sufficient uh, level uh, for 12 hours prior to simulated ischemia and perfusion. And during this time, we measured oxygen consumption rate and extracellular acidification rate using the extracellular flux analyzer or seahorse. This is uh, a Seahorse published template for mito stress uh, test, and it shows um, uh, on the y axis is the oxygen consumption rate, and on the x axis is the time. Uh, uh, started off with the basal respiration. Uh, we added some um, uh, agonist and antagonist of the electron transport uh, chain, uh, and uh, we measured that different uh, level. So this is the mito stress test. Uh, result for uh, our experiment. Uh, it started off with the basal um, uh, respiration. The blue line is uh, control group. The yellow line is uh, 50 nanomole of vitamin D and the purple line is the 100 nanomole of vitamin D. Uh, as you can see uh, at the start of the basal respiration, uh, the 50 and 100 nanomole of vitamin D already were showing um, uh, 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 significantly lower oxygen consumption rate. Uh, when we expose the solutions to oligomycin, um, which um, uh, it blocks ATP synthase uh, of the electron transport chain and reduces respiration, you can see all three, um, there was significant reduction in the uh, oxygen consumption rate in the three groups. And then we um, introduced FCCP, um, which is a um, uncoupling agent that disrupts the mitochondrial membrane potential, uh, resulting in maximal respiration. Uh, you can see that uh, there is significant, uh, significantly lower oxygen consumption rate in the 50 and 100 nanomole vitamin D compared to the control group. And then we uh, introduce rotenone and antimycin A, uh, which again inhibits uh, cellular respiration and the cellular respiration significantly reduces. Uh, these are uh, our uh, results. Um, vitamin D treated cardiomyocytes, uh, basal respiration during simulated reperfusion was reduced by 46% in 50 nanomole 
uh, of vitamin D group and 67% in 100 nanomole of vitamin D group compared to control group and stimulating the cardiomyocytes with FCCP to elicit maximum respiration resulted in 60 uh, to 70% reduction in oxygen uh, consumption in the two vitamin D uh, groups compared to the control group and uh, the non-mitochondrial respiration or uh, glycolysis uh, was reduced by 20% and 60% in the 50 and 100 nanomole of vitamin D groups respectively. So we can conclude that the observed decrease in mitochondrial and non-mitochondrial respiration may be a physiological mechanism to aid cell survival. Uh, vitamin D therefore may be a protective agent to limit ischemia reperfusion during cardiac surgery um, understanding the therapeutic dose that optimally uh, represses uh, oxygen consumption and prevents the accumulation of cell damaging um, uh, ROS needs further study and we propose a, uh, an appropriately designed randomized controlled trial uh, that uh, with vitamin D supplementation perioperatively uh, in patients undergoing uh, cardiac uh, surgery. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, thank you. That, that I think concludes the presentations, doesn't it? Indeed, indeed. Excellent. It, gives me, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce our uh, guest speaker who's going to deliver the Heart Research UK Lecture, Development, uh, Validation and Translation of Safe Cardiovascular Treatments, Professor Aschione. Thank you. Hello everybody, um, I am Raimondo Ascione from Bristol, UK, and I would like to thank the Society for the very kind invitation to provide this contribution to the Heart Research UK session. We are living into a biomedical revolution uh, with advance of uh, lots of biomedical technologies uh, and therefore uh, the implementation and adoption of uh, many biomedical devices in any surgical uh, speciality. Uh, in this uh, process, um, the, the role of the typical clinicians is perhaps uh, more marginal than in the past. However, the focus of the duty remain patient safety and possibly steering away from a conflict of interest. We have uh, several examples of uh, devices that have been adopted and uh, associated with the major safety issues a few years down the line. And you must, must have heard about the um, uh, mesh surgery and how this is associated with devastating side effects in thousands of women globally as well as the issue associated with the several breast implants and cancer leading uh, to recalls by the regulatory bodies. There's a lot more to this uh, and uh, if you have interest in this area, I uh, highlight to you this interesting web page uh, where uh, there are many devices reported with safety issues, including few cardiovascular devices. Uh, we can nowadays um, track registered trials and this is interesting uh, to note that uh, out of more than 30,000 trials uh, registered since 2006, uh, more than 45% of them are not being reported, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, of obvious uh, uh, possible concern and you can also see who are the sponsors of these trials. Concomitantly, there is now strong evidence suggesting that at the basic science level, um, there is a, an obvious issue in, in uh, re reproducibility of, of data. So, uh, through this large survey, roughly 90% of scientists have declared that their issue in reproducing their own results or the results of colleagues being published. Here you see the translational pathway of a new intervention from when the idea is conceived to when it's hopefully reaching bedside. It might take 15 years for this process if everything goes well. 
but it's a bumpy road with the issue associated with the funding. There's a lot of fundings early by government and university. This then dry out completely, quite almost completely with the industry um, being um, the main uh, supporter of, of a large trials you know, in the healthcare system. Thousands of uh, discovery may start this process, only few may reach this side of the translational pathway, and there is this intermediate section which is called the value of death, where most of these uh, treatments kind of die off, mostly due to lack of funding, but also lack of advanced facility uh, where a typical clinician can get involved uh, for the um, um, final step validation of this device. It's an obvious aspect associated with the safety that we should highlight and that uh, in this long pathway, this large part here is not really formally regulated. All the responsibilities up to the leading scientist for a given uh, new treatment. Mm -hmm. The first gate uh, is uh, at this level when eventually a new treatment is, uh, put, is proposed for first in main trial. This is when uh, regulatory approval must be obtained. And of course, if that is the case, then th that treatment is being tested into a first in men trials and then perhaps into a phase two, phase three trials. Beyond the, the lifespan of a trial, the safety of, of interventions adopted is actually up to us, the, the scientific and clinical community through hopefully um, rigorous um, uh, internal audit and the uh, presence of rigorous database registry, which is an obvious thing to say, but uh, not always obvious uh, things to see and implement uh, uh, locally. So, so fro fro from this background, uh, I will now try to evaluate factors influencing uh, um, safety and effectiveness of new treatment uh, uh, with a focus uh, initially on, on the final step preclinical validation phase. This is something where rarely clinicians uh, get involved, mostly because there aren't uh, institutional, many institutional facilities uh, where uh, this could be um, happening. Uh, and I will present a, a little bit about the Translation Biomedical Research Center in Bristol and a couple of projects that are being run there to highlight the type of work being done. But most of it will be about evaluation of factors uh, into the kind of um, research undertaken in, health, uh, undertaken in healthcare system with the kind of um, evaluation of several factors uh, through the uh, evaluation of several uh, randomized trials being reported in the past, as well as the value of uh, uh, database registry uh, a report uh, and uh, finally a, a report by the FDA. So, so a, a, an advanced research facility for a, a final step validation on new treatment need to look really, really like a, an hospital where a, 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 a clinician can be comfortable in undertaking the procedures. So the specifications must be very high. And these are, this is, these are a snapshot of the Translation Biomedical Research Center here in Bristol with an hybrid lab with, 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 with a, a, an advanced MRI suite. And of course, the procedure must be run by senior veterinary clinicians for the animal interface. And of course, the actual experiment and procedures for testing of a new valve, new device, or percutaneous approach by uh, by um, uh, um, uh, clinicians um, that uh, are also informed. It is this special combination that allow very high reproducibility and therefore evaluation at clinical standard of a device in terms of safety and efficacy. So here you have a couple of examples. This is an example of a new heart valve designed in collaboration between myself and Professor Job the mortgage uh, um, uh, in, 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 in Cambridge. Uh, Jeff is basically an outstanding uh, biomaterial scientist. And it is uh, through this uh, combination of expertise that we conceived the, the, the concept as well as uh, developed the product over time through several prototype until we reach the J6 prototype, which is what we think is now clinically meaningful. It, it was a completely different manufacturing with a lot of combinational modeling and then injection of a block copolymers through a mold. 
So then the final product was produced. You can see the J6 prototype here into an accelerated tester. You, uh, you can do a bench durability test at ISO standard, which showed that this valve has a durability of more than 32 years on average. Concomitantly, hydrodynamic performance com confirmed that the valve has, is as good as a one of the best in class biological device per amount valve. And we have done a short term uh, in vivo feasibility test that has uh, confirmed the safety, the suitability, as well as uh, uh, no structural problems and no uh, presence of thrombosis. So all of this uh, important for us to move forward into a chronic uh, in vivo preclinical study. But this is really to highlight how this is possible if there is the right facility and the right uh, people, including uh, clearly physicians uh, for uh, a project like this to take off and develop well. Similarly, um, um, moving more into the cardiology percutaneous type of procedures, we obviously, thanks to the presence of an hybrid theater, can run percutaneous procedures. Uh, and through this project led um, in partnership by the University of Bristol, myself and, and, and UK-based company Arterius, obviously with significant funding from uh, art uh, um, UK RI and therefore Innovate UK. So with this uh, basically um, uh, in place, then uh, and the leadership of uh, um, Dr. Tom Johnson, who's one of our senior interventional cardiologists, one can undertake a percutaneous angiography evaluation, a positioning of uh, this uh, stent, which in this case is into a carotid artery model. So then OCT evaluation can be undertaken exactly as it is does uh, is that uh, done in the NHS and, and beyond that uh, and in addition to what is done of course in the NHS one can undertake a detailed histopathology that is all going to provide a, a ming meaningful package of information for the safety and, and efficacy of the device uh, in, in uh, being tested. With that, uh, we can we can now move into kind of uh, evaluation of, of uh, factors uh, influencing uh, safety and efficacy uh, in the NHS. And, and I'm doing that simply by picking up a few randomized trials first and highlighting some controversial aspect. So this, the first three are to do with the validation of beating up corner edge, which has been happening over the last roughly 25 years in particular, and we have uh, we here in Bristol have been um, undertaking at very early stage a, a, a trial and, and trial called BACAS 1 and 2 with 400 patients, targeting elective and semi elective patients mostly and focusing mostly on early in hospital outcome. We showed that actually the, the, the beating surgery was superior uh, in terms of early hospital outcome to conventional technique. And seven, eight years later, we confirmed that, that uh, there was similar patency of all graph done with no difference in cardiac event free survival. So this was our approach in a relatively small trial uh, at the, in a very early stage. Few years down the line, we saw the Ruby trial. Um, which eventually uh, um, uh, enrolled, enrolled more than 2,000 patients in the multi center and suggested that uh, off pump surgery was associated with the reduced survival and freedom from measured five years. The only caveat in this uh, um, uh, trial was uh, the a key design aspect allowing. Uh, um, junior surgeons or trainees with experience of only 25 off pump cases to actually be formal recruit. The third one um, is uh, at the coronary trials, a very large global trials with uh, roughly 5,000 patients, very strict uh, design uh, based on surgical expertise uh, based randomization and no surgeon with the less than 100 procedures as a personal experience would have allowed to be a recruiter. So this type of, with this type of design at one in five years, uh, basically both um, um, uh, procedures were really very effective with no difference between the two type of uh, um, approach. So here you have now three trials showing superiority, inferiority, and similarity between the two procedures, suggesting therefore that uh, RCT, although they are always regarded as the best thing to do, might have a weakness and difference in study design that uh, might lead to conflicting results and conclusion. Moving into the PCI type of world versus cabbage, eventually what you see is the syntax trial, a triple best and left main table disease, five years outcome, confirming the superiority of cabbage versus PCI for mace, for death stroke and MI only. 
And also when they did this sub-analysis after coming up with a syntax score intermediate or high risk, what you can see is that there is a, a, high, a reduced incidence of um, um, cumulative event for the cabbage, uh, as cumulative event, but also specific to that and MI, which was much higher in the PCI group, the same when, uh, and even worse, when, uh, when the high score group was considered. So, of course, with such a type of trial and such type of outcome, one can only hope that uh, the findings and conclusions uh, uh, of these guys are uh, implemented properly uh, across the UK or globally uh, for the interest of patient safety. Of uh, the Excel trial is another important trial published more recently, quite controversial, with a focus on left main uh, disease uh, in patients with the syntax score less than 32. Uh, the primary outcome being death, stroke, and MI, uh, and the trial showing no difference at five years. There's been a lot of controversy, about, uh, controversy around the definition of uh, MI used, of course, and this other interesting and elegant study in almost 8,000 patients in patients with multivessel disease having PCI or cabbage is demonstrating that based on the type of definition used on the same patient population, one can show that PCI is worse than cabbage or just the opposite that cabbage is worse than PCI or that there is no difference. This aspect highlights how randomized trials are of course very important, but, but the weakness in study design or, or issue with the trial scaling and delivery might lead to, to biased or, or conflicting results conclusions. Uh, on the other hand, we have this other important kind of uh, tool, which is uh, indeed the database registry and therefore our structure for audit. Uh, and uh, what you see here is, is a report, a transformational report published in 1986, suggesting that the mammary artery graft are superior to vein and leading to increase the survival and reduce the reoperation rate. So this, the, 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 after this publication, surgeons went back home and started to use uh, mammary artery on a massive transformational basis. And this is highlighting the value of uh, rigorous uh, database register and therefore real life data and how this can then transform the, 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 the things that we do. Uh, along the same line, a couple of uh, much less um, kind of, uh, kind of uh, powerful, but still interesting, uh, um, um, example. We did in Bristol a, a, a risk adjust analysis on, on obese high risk patients, again with a focus on uh, safety and efficacy of beating heart surgery. And we demonstrated in this particular patient population that uh, the beating heart surgery was associated with reduced in hospital mortality and stroke. Along the same line, perhaps in a more elegant study, a few years down the line, it was demonstrated by the group led by Puskas that if you operate on patients with a low STS score, there is no difference in observed mortality. But as you operate on more and more on patients with a high STS score, there is clearly a benefit in observed mortality associated with the beating heart coronary surgery. And this is simply to say as a message that therefore rigorous database registry are really important and powerful and protectors of the safety of um, our patient. It is therefore critical to, to, to keep this uh, database rigorous uh, as well as the structure for local audit and governance uh, and therefore it's important to keep funding this structure properly. Uh, finally, I have this report from FDA, uh, and this actually reports uh, 14 years of cumulative data, uh, FDA data, on adverse events associated with the robotic surgery in any surgical specialty. It's difficult to find a database of this type in a, a unit or even nationally, and therefore you can only see a report like this through these important regulatory bodies. And what this is showing is that there's been a very high incidence of um, adverse event in increasing over time, clearly to do with the widespread in practice of robotic surgery. And as you can see, the whole event per procedures remained as kind of consistently high 
over time. And more interestingly, perhaps, is when they group the different surgical speciality, uh, you could see that the, the group, including cardiothoracic and the neck and others, had a significant higher um, um, association with the death injury conversion rate. So this is the, 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 the conclusion, so a few final considerations that are already highlighted in actually some of these slides in relation to um, the um, uh, kind of development, validation and translation of safe device. And with that, uh, I obviously would like to thank Heart Research UK in particular for uh, sponsoring this session and the SETS more in general. Uh, I would like also to thank uh, the, the charity funding body supporting my research here in Bristol. And in particular, I would like to thank yourself for your uh, uh, very kind uh, uh, attention. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Gaskioni, for a very insightful <laughs> and thought provoking talk. Uh, this concludes this session. I thank all the uh, presenters for their talks, and I am grateful for my co-chairs for a successful session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mahu, and thank you. to David. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.